Hello friends, this video on biomolecules part 20 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. Now there are many factors that can affect the enzyme's activity. So some of the factors are temperature, pH, enzyme concentration, substrate concentration and competitive inhibition. So these are some of the factors. Now the first four factors are, I mean by the names you can at least understand what they are trying to say. The last one is little new. So we will spend some time understanding how each of these factors affect the enzyme activity. So let us start with temperature and pH. Now what happens is that some of these conditions affect the tertiary structure of proteins. We were talking about the denaturation of proteins, right? So when the tertiary structure gets affected, the action of the enzyme also gets affected. Now when you talk about temperature, what happens is that, let us suppose if this is your enzyme activity, And this is your temperature. So it is seen that the enzyme activity is highest at an optimum temperature. So this is the optimum temperature. So beyond this temperature, the enzyme tends to the activity tends to decrease. What happens is at a very low temperature, so if you talk about temperature below the optimum temperature, the enzyme remains active. So the enzyme is not at all active. If you talk about a very high temperature, more than the optimum temperature, in that case the enzyme gets destroyed because due to too much of heat, the proteins get denatured. So the tertiary structure gets broken and only the primary structure of the protein is left. And the primary structure is not functional because it is not a three-dimensional structure. So that ways the enzyme will remain active only at an optimum temperature. Very low temperature as well as very high temperature both will affect the en enzyme activity adversely. So in fact, this is also a reason why if you keep stuffs in refrigerator, it stops the enzyme activity and therefore the milk does not get curdled because the enzymes cannot act at that temperature. So that is why we often keep stuffs in refri refrigerator to save it or to prevent it from getting spoiled. Now when you talk about pH, again the behavior is almost the same. Now different enzymes have different optimum pH. So in pH also you have an optimum pH. That is a value of pH for which the enzyme activity is maximum. Below that it degrades, above that it again degrades. But one thing to note here is different enzymes will have different optimum pH. For example, if you talk about the enzymes which help in the process of digestion. So the digestive enzymes mostly have uh, acidic pH as their optimum pH. So they want acidic or basic pH. That is their optimum pH. Whereas if you talk about intracellular enzymes, they want a neutral pH, neither acidic medium nor basic medium. So the requirement of an optimum pH changes with different enzymes. Now let us look at the next factor that is enzyme concentration and substrate concentration. So when you talk about the enzyme concentration, it is seen that, let us suppose this displays enzyme concentration on the x-axis and this is the rate of reaction or the speed or velocity of reaction. Now it is observed that as the enzyme concentration increases, initially the rate of reaction also increases. But after a certain point, so if you see after this point, even though the enzyme con concentration is still increasing, but the rate of reaction is not increasing anymore. So this means that with increase in enzyme concentration, the rate of reaction increases, but it increases only up to a certain point beyond which it doesn't increase anymore. Why does that happen? Why is this behavior? This is because now if your enzyme concentration is increasing too much, now basically what happens in the mechanism of enzyme activity is enzyme has to combine with the substrate to form enzyme substrate complex. Now if you have too much of enzymes, the concentration of enzymes alone is increasing, so a point will come where the substrate will get over, so there is no more substrate, but you have too much of enzyme, so that enzyme has nothing to combine to form the enzyme substrate complex, so that enzyme is of no use. 
So even if you keep on adding more and more enzymes, it is not going to be of any help because it cannot form enzyme substrate complex. So the rate of reaction will remain the same. It will not change. It will not increase. So that is why the enzyme concentration should not be increased too much because that really doesn't help. Now similar is the case with substrate concentration as well. So here also in this case, when the, as I said, enzyme and substrate com combines to form enzyme substrate complex. Now in this case again, it is seen that the rate of reaction will increase, but it will increase only up to a certain point. Because if after a certain point, let us suppose your enzyme is fixed, but your substrate, substrate concentration is increasing, increasing, increasing. You are adding on more and more substrate. So what will happen? Now, substrate will not have any more enzymes to combine and form enzyme substrate complex. So in that case also, the reaction rate will not be affected. So we should always make sure that the concentration of enzymes and the concentration of the substrate should be comparable because we need both of them to form the enzyme substrate complex. And formation of enzyme substrate complex is the first step for enzyme activity to take place. If the enzyme substrate complex itself is not formed, then that enzyme is of no use. Then having that enzyme is of no use. So the concentration of both enzymes as well as substrate should be comparable. And the last factor is competitive inhibition. So first, let us try to understand what is inhibition. Then we will see what is competitive inhibition. Now, let us suppose that this is your enzyme. So this is your enzyme and this is the active site. This is the active site of the enzyme. Now this active site, as I said, is meant for a substrate which can fit into this. So it not any, just, it is not that just any substance that fit into, can fit into this active site. But what if there is some other substance also, which has a shape very much similar to the Substrate that is possible right because that substrate alone is not the only one who can fit into the active site It is possible that there are some substances which have a similar shape like the substrate So ideally what should happen? This is your substrate So this is s your substrate So ideally what should happen is that this substrate should come and it should combine with the enzyme to form enzyme substrate complex But now let us suppose there is another substance which has a similar structure so if you see it is not exact the structure is not exactly the same these two structures are not exactly the same but if you look at this end the shape of this end of this substance is very similar to the shape of this end of the substrate now there is a possibility that this substance which is not the true substrate but this can also go and it can also combine with the enzyme that is a possibility, right? Now, what will happen if it combines with the enzyme, even, even though it is not the substrate, but it will block the substrate from combining with the enzyme because it has already blocked the active site. Now, since the active site is blocked, now the actual substrate cannot combine with the enzyme. Now, actual substrate is the one which we need for the chemical reaction to take place. Now, if the active sub, uh, actual substrate is blocked from being uh, combining with the enzyme, so the enzyme will not be able to do its activity. So this process is known as inhibition where some other molecule with a shape very similar to the substrate blocks the active site of the enzyme. So such molecule is known as inhibitor. So these kind of molecules, so these kind of molecules are termed as inhibitors and this process is known as inhibition so what are they these are molecule with shape similar to the substrate so in the process of inhibition what do they do they block active site of enzyme So this is all about inhibition. Now since here this inhibitor creates a competition with the substrate. So there is a competition between the substrate and the inhibition inhibitor to occupy the active site. That is why it is known as competitive inhibition. So these are some of these were some of the factors which uh, affect the enzyme activity. 
So now that we have discussed quite a few things about enzymes, let us quickly discuss the different types of enzymes which exist. Oxidoreductases. So these are the enzymes which catalyze oxidation reduction between two substrates. As I mentioned before, if you have two substrates, S1 and S2, so these kind of enzymes will oxidize one substrate and it will reduce the other substrate. So that is their strategy. So those kind of enzymes are called oxidoreductases. The next type is transferases. The name itself says they transfer something. So what do they do? They transfer a group from one substrate to another. Let us suppose we have two substrates, S1 and S2. So there is a group, say, attached to S1. So what will these enzymes do? These enzymes will act upon this and it will transfer the group from S1 to S2. So you see the group gets transferred from S1 to S2. So such enzymes are called transferases. Hydrolases. So it has something to, to do with water. So it helps in the process of hydrolysis. What does it do? It causes hydrolysis, breaking larger molecules into smaller ones. So hydrolysis happens of larger molecules, that is breaking down of the peptide bonds or the glycosidic bonds. So there it plays a role. So one example is maltase. So when maltose is broken down into glucose and galactose, so there is an enzyme which plays a role. For example, maltose breaks down to form glucose. So the enzyme which plays the role is maltase. So this enzyme is a hydrolase because it helps in the process of hydrolysis. So most of the digestive enzymes are examples of hydrolases. Next is lyases. So these enzymes break covalent bonds. So wherever covalent bonds exist, they break those bonds. So how do they break covalent bonds? Let us suppose we have a compound like this. So what do they do? They will break the covalent bonds in this way. So if you see the bond between X and C and Y and C is broken. So they help in breaking of covalent bonds. Isomerases. So they are named after isomers because they catalyze rearrangement of molecular structures to form isomers. Because there are so many structures which are like their uh, formula remains the same, but the way they are arranged, that is different. So these enzymes help in rearrangement of structures to form isomers. Ligases, they link covalent bonds between substrates to form a larger molecule. So they do just the opposite of li liases. Liases break covalent bonds and ligases join the covalent bonds or they link the covalent bonds. So they are just the reverse of each other. So with this, so we have reached towards the end of our discussion on enzymes and I think by now you know how important are enzymes and you would have also understand their structure, their functions and how are they important in the metabolism. Thank you. Please visit www.examfear.com to watch more videos, attempt free online test, get free study material, find tutors and mentors. Thank you once again.